Hudson River steamboat steaming up and down. New York to Albany or any river town. Choo choo to go ahead, choo choo to slacker. Captain and the first mate, they both chew to backer. Choo choo to go ahead, choo choo to slacker. Packet boat, tow boat, and a double stacker. Choo choo to Tarrytown, spite and dival all around. Choo choo to go ahead and choo choo to backer. Shad boat, pickle boat, laying side by side. Fisher folk, sailor men, waiting for the tide. Rain cloud, storm cloud over yonder hill. Thunder on the Dunderberg rumbles in the kill. Choo choo to go ahead, choo choo to slacker. Packet boat, tow boat, and a double stacker. Choo choo to Tarrytown, spite and dival all around. Choo choo to go ahead, and choo choo to backer. Robert Fulton was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1765. His father died when he was only three years old and his mother lost the farm that they had purchased, leaving her with Robert, the oldest, along with three younger sisters and a brother, Abraham. Mother Mary Fulton homeschooled Robert until he was eight years old. When he went to school with others, he was said not to distinguish himself, but cared more for painting and an interest in mechanical things. Even at an early age, while out fishing with a friend, he thought about how he could make a boat self-propelled and experimented on the Conestoga River near his home. At 17 years old, Fulton went to Philadelphia to study painting. He supported himself in the interval with his pencil and proved himself capable of doing good work in making drawings of machinery as well as in painting landscapes. He also made the acquaintance of Benjamin Franklin, then about to be sent to the court of France and of other distinguished citizens of Philadelphia. Shortly after buying a home for his mother, Fulton had a serious attack of inflammation of the lungs, accompanied by spitting of blood. He went to the warm springs of Virginia to recuperate and made new acquaintances there. Upon his return, he made preparations, and in late 1786 or early 1787, he sailed for England to study with artist Benjamin West. With him, he carried a letter of introduction from Benjamin Franklin. He arrived in England with only 40 guineas in his pocket. He also made the acquaintance of others who shared his scientific and mechanical aspirations, including the Duke of Bridgewater and Lord Stanhope of England. His mother received a long overdue letter from him in early 1792, which provides a good account of his activity up to this point, as well as his current status. His mother read the letter to herself. My dear mother, it gives me much pleasure to hear of Abraham's attention to you, though I am sorry he has run away with the idea of my getting rich. I only wish it was true, but I cannot conceive from whence the report arose. And I must now give some little history of my life since I came to London. I brought not more than 40 guineas to England, and was set down in a strange country without a friend, and only one letter of introduction to Mr. West. Here I had an art to learn by which I was to earn my bread, but little to support whilst I was doing it. And numbers of eminent men of the same profession, which I must excel before I could hope to live. Many a silent, solitary hour have I spent in the most unnerved study, anxiously pondering how to make funds to support me, till the fruits of my labors should be sufficient to repay them. Thus I went on for near four years, happily beloved by all who knew me, or I had long ere now been crushed by poverty's cold wind and freezing rain, till last summer I was invited by Lord Courtney down to his country seat to paint a picture of him which gave his lordship so much pleasure that he introduced me to all his friends. And it is but just now that I am beginning to get a little money and pay some debt, which I was obliged to contract, so I hope in about six months to be clear with the world, or in other words, out of debt and then start fair to make all I can. You see, dear mother, 
This is very different from being rich. Not that I can say I was ever in absolute want. Heaven has been kind to me, and I am thankful. Hoping now to go on smooth and happy, as the absence of my friends will admit of. I am happy to hear that all relations are well. I shall write to them separately. I enjoy excellent health, which I hope will continue till I may have the happiness of seeing you. Please to remember me kindly to Mr. Smith and all friends, and may heaven continue its blessings towards you, is the most unfeigned wish of your obedient son, Robert Fulton. In 1797, Fulton moved to France and lived with the American minister Joe Barlow and his wife Ruth. As some have politely said, he became part of the family. Others have described the arrangement in a somewhat different manner. He lived there for seven years and during that time he began experimenting with torpedoes and his thoughts turned to the submarine or plunging boat as he himself referred to it. It is uncertain if Fulton would have made any progress with steamboats if it were not for the arrival in France of Chancellor Robert R. Livingston, Ambassador of the United States to France. With Livingston's help, Fulton designed and submitted plans for a side-wheeled steamboat to Napoleon. This could have been one of Napoleon's best moments, but due to an earlier mishap and the sinking during a demonstration on the Seine, the experiment attracted little attention. And while some consider Robert Fulton to be the inventor of the steamboat, he was not. Fulton and others before him had experimented with steam-powered boats. Robert Fulton acknowledges he was not the first in a letter he wrote, along with a collection of his work that he left to France in 1803. It was not until 1786 that we find the first boat successfully propelled by steam in America in John Fitch's clumsy contrivance which was tried on the Delaware July 27th of that year. This boat was worked by gangs of oars or paddles arranged in a framework at the boat's side. Robert Fulton's success, where others to this point had failed, was in building the first commercially viable steam-powered boat and turning it into a timely and profitable transportation business. But as we now know, these were not his only achievements. Livingston then communicated to Mr. Fulton the importance of steamboats to the common country, informed him of what had been attempted in America, and of his resolution to resume the pursuit on his return and advised Fulton to turn his attention to the subject. In 1806, Robert Fulton returned to America and made his home in New York and began building a steamboat. It is a given fact that Fulton, with the help and guidance of Livingston, leveraged the work of many others before them. Some have attempted to disparage Fulton's name and his accomplishments as nothing more than luck. Upon his return to New York, Robert Fulton immediately began building a steamboat working through the winter and into the summer. He had taken a room at a boarding house and utilized the services of Charles Brown Shipyard on the East River. He had previously ordered a steam engine from Watt and Bolton while in England before his return to New York, and although previously held up by export restrictions, it had arrived in time. Money was tight, and he had to privately request contributions from a number of benefactors. His benefactors did not want to be publicly known as being part of Fulton's folly. In the days leading up to August 17, 1807, the North River steamboat was taken around and moored in the Hudson, or North River as it was referred to at the time. Fulton had to hire men to guard the boat from both the detractors and careless sloop pilots. In one letter, Fulton even describes his passengers as anxiety mixed with fear, and that they were silent, sad, and weary. The boiler was fired, and around 1 p.m. the throttle was opened. 
The side wheels began to spin and the steamboat began to move. Fulton himself was at the wheel. Those on board began to cheer and skeptics were converted. No such sight had been seen on the river before. Like the first time of seeing a Wright Flyer or Henry Hudson coming up the river, things were about to change forever. Some who saw it at night described it as a monster, moving on the waters to find the winds and tide and breathing flames and smoke. Some even thought it was a floating sawmill. The nervousness of the many guests on the first trip turned to joy as they proceeded up the river. As they reached the highlands, as it was said that Robert Fulton's favorite song was Ye Banks and Braes, O Bonnie Doon, they broke out in song. Ye Banks and Braes, O Bonnie Doon, how can ye bloom so fresh and fair? Robert Fulton best describes the success of his voyage in a letter he wrote to Joel Barlow shortly after the first trip. My steamboat voyage to Albany and back has turned out rather more favorably than I had calculated. The distance from New York to Albany is 150 miles. I ran it up in 32 hours and down in 30. I had a light breeze against me the whole way, both going and coming and the voyage has been performed wholly by the power of the steam engine. I overtook many sloops and schooners beating to the windward and parted with them as if they had been at anchor. The power of propelling boats by steam is now fully proved. The morning I left New York, there were not perhaps 30 persons in the city who believed that the boat would ever move one mile an hour or be of the least utility and while we were putting off from the wharf, which was crowded with spectators, I heard a number of sarcastic remarks. This is the way in which ignorant men compliment what they call philosophers and projectors. Having employed much time, money, and zeal in accomplishing this work, it gives me, as it will you, great pleasure to see it fully answer my expectations. It will give a cheap and quick conveyance to the merchandise on the Mississippi, Missouri, and other great rivers which are now laying open their treasures to the enterprise of our countrymen. And although the prospect of personal emolument has been some inducement to me, yet I feel infinitely more pleasure in reflecting on the immense advantage that my country will derive from the invention. During the next eight years, in addition to improving his steamboat and building more, he built ferries, floating docks to accept them. He had further proven his experiments with torpedoes and worked with the U.S. government on multiple projects, including a steam-powered warship. Robert Fulton believed that the liberty of the seas will be the happiness of the earth. Robert Fulton died February 24, 1815, after catching cold and his tuberculosis, otherwise known as consumption, had flared. At the time of his death, Robert Fulton was in the service of the U.S. government. There was a large procession leading to Trinity Church in New York. His body is buried in the Livingston family vault.
like seeing it for the first time it takes my breath away when I look out on the river I imagine days gone by it takes me to another place in another time to see it from the mountains to see it from the air watching the water running washing away where they built the town A people that seem quite friendly That did not ask to be found The river we changed forever We would not be here today beginning everyone here to stay Takes my breath.